Hello and welcome to Love Work Life and welcome to our 21st, yes that's the 21st webinar on the series of helping managers uh, through their time. Quick question as always is can you hear me? If you can, if you can put something in the chat box or in the question and answer box it'd be much appreciated. As I said this week Paul and I decided um, mainly because I think uh, we decided to be a little bit lazy this week and not write anything that we just answer your questions. Well, no, actually we thought the amount of questions that we're getting through now that are coming through, we thought we should start to really answer them directly because there's quite a lot that we think are very poignant. The more we asked the, uh, of you this week, the more questions we've got and we've got some really, really top questions. What I'm going to do though is I'm rather mentioning who's asked the question. I think some of the questions might need a bit of anonymity, if I could say the word. Uh, so I'm going to sort of work on that, that front and talk the question through okay and then me and Paul will answer the questions I'm going to try be as quick as possible on some of the questions mainly because I think we've covered them quite a lot in some of the topics that we've already done uh, but we will try answer every single question also the amount of questions that we've got and as I said on the email that I sent out today some of the questions could be a webinar completely by themselves I think it's important that we do touch them so the first question that we're going to hit off with so are you ready then Paul I'm, I'm yeah. all fired up. Let's do this. Good. Okay. The first question is, and I, I love this question because I think it's on everyone's lips at the moment, is how do we fire the guys up after the general malaise? And I'm assuming that's general malaise is as they come back from uh, lockdown. Oh, I thought malaise was something you put on salad. That tells you what I know about that word. Um, so actually, I mean, just to pick up your point, Howard, I think we, you know, we, we decided we were thinking of a thing for today. And we've had so much fantastic feedback from people and so many questions every week that although we've done our level best to answer them, we have absolutely run out of time every week. And here we have, and we're looking at a spreadsheet here of about, I don't know, 20 questions, you know, uh, and we said, let's, let's just tackle as many as we can during this hour. Um, so this first question, how do we fire up the guys uh, from their general malaise is a really good one. We're, we're going to um, avoid, as uh, I think we've said, uh, uh, saying who's raised these questions, keep it confidential. But this is a really good one. So we're talking here, I think, about people that are now coming back from uh, their um, furlough, their sabbatical. We're also talking about people, of course, who are, have been working during this last four months, but you know, clearly, given the incredible circumstances, not normally, in inverted commas, so how do you shake people up, get them back into what we now know is going to be a very different environment and unquestionably um, a recessive climate? Um, so how do we do that? Well, we've talked a lot about this, Howard, and I think it really comes back down to a couple of very important things. Number one, let's deal with the reality of where we're at. So I think this comes down to leadership. What is it that we are genuinely going to encounter when we get back to work? And that's already happening. So managing expectations, absolutely. Let's recognize that this is a different world to the one we left in March. Our guys need to understand that very clearly. So this comes down to discussions around our vision, our goals, our mission, our values, our behaviors. You know, we've said repeatedly, this is a pause button that's been pushed over the last four months. It's not been a stop button. We are about to push, or we have already, I should add, pushed the play button, getting back into it again, but it's not the same. So let's recalibrate our vision, our goals, but ultimately we're not changing that much from where we were pre-COVID, except to say that I think it's up to leaders to reinvigorate people that work with us to get them really vibed up for what is going to be going on get those energy levels up, get their heads, heads into the right space. I think, and we're going to talk about this, Howard, aren't we? We're going to talk about training, coaching, getting people to get fit for what we now know will be a different workplace, work environment, dealing with diffi difficult challenges, different objections, a lot of we don't need anymore at this moment, a lot of redundancies that we're going to see. But the positives are, an opportunity to build real market share during this, this new period. And I think it comes down to being very close to your people, 
understanding them individually, personally, what's going on in their worlds, their individual worlds, their home lives, their personal situation, both at work and at home, and really understanding where their, their heads are at. And I think that's all about mental well-being. It's also about us expressing it the way we feel about the future, expressing, if you like, and it's not a weakness, our own anxieties, let's share those, not in a horrible way, but let people know we're not immune. But it's very much about building a collaborative team experience. We're in this together. Let's get out there. Let's make it happen. And talking about the ways in which we're going to engage with our clients and candidates and, and the way in which we're going to separate ourselves from the pack. So I think it's quite interesting when I start to push that onto the second question again, and I'll answer that on the first question. How do you motivate your consultants who fear rightly being made redundant? I think my simple answer to that is by being open and honest with each individual person about what the business is looking to achieve. I'm not saying you have to open up about the financial statement of the business or the financial sort of runnings of the business. But if you've got a business plan in place and that business plan is involving your consultants, then rightly you should be telling your consultants what that is. And you should be setting mini milestones all the way through that process for them to achieve. The more you get them involved in that process of putting together that plan, the more they're involved in pulling together that plan, the more they'll come out of that malaise, the more they'll start to understand that they're not being made redundant, that you've brought them back in to build the business back to where it is and beyond that. And so I think it's really important that that honesty bit comes out and really start to work with them. I think also the other side of that is asking your people for you know, their thoughts, what their fears and worries are. And so you can get those worries out on the table and then actually then dis, you know, distill it all down to what the common denominator is. And the common denominator is for the business to function, the business has to change its processes and move forward very quickly. And that means looking at what your clients are doing, looking at what your candidates are doing, and making sure that your consultants are on top of that marketplace and they're achieving those mini goal sets. And that to me sort of leads into the next bank of questions that we've got, Paul. And I'm going to read quite a few questions out here, guys, uh, that I think are is poignant and will help again answer those first two questions. So the next questions are all about training. So the questions that we have, Paul, here are the best way to keep training interest within a, two, uh, a small two-team uh, business or a small two-team. Uh, training in bite-sized chunks, best than half a day stroke full day. What training should leaders be focusing on that we all need to adapt? Lots of businesses seem to neglect training and mental health well-being during COVID-19. Is it too late for them? How do we ensure best practice from training in a virtual world and what is the single most important channel to training your consultants, e.g. old school, headhunting, selling retainers, etc. So I think we've got an awful lot sort of there on the training front to talk about, Paul. And let me sort of kick off on that because I think we need to sort of keep some of these answers short because we've covered training an awful lot last week. Yep. Is um, I think the half day versus full day is a very interesting one. Um, if you start to go speak to when we, we built the online uh, Love Work Life Online Training Academy, we spent an awful lot of time with educationalists talking about how people learn. And what they're saying is if you went on a full day course, you know, let's say today is Tuesday, by Friday, you'll probably retain around about 70% of that course. However, by next Friday, that will have degraded down to about 30%. And by the following Friday, it'll be around about 10%. And they'll actually only be applying between 5 and 10% of what they've learned on that course. What they're saying is if you do short, sharp training sessions, 30 minutes, which have visual stimulus, mental stimulus, and gives them an opportunity to reply back to those courses, then they retain a far more and they're able to engage with it straight away. So I think there is a place for half day and full day. But I think now as we're coming out, we want that short, sharp shock training coming in so people can instantly get on the phones and use what they're doing. And that goes about evolving your practice to make sure that you are 
evaluating your consultants constantly so you need to know what they are focusing on so what they're doing each single day if you're finding what their strengths are and their weaknesses are each individual day then you can start to build banks of training sessions and you could almost do training sessions i remember sort of when i first started with certain uh, businesses and certain consultants i'd be doing 20 30 minute sessions every single day with everybody whether over a lunch time last thing at night first thing in the morning etc to give people that momentum and give people that you know um i suppose drive to go away and do that and put that on to, uh, into best practice and i think if we talk about best practice in the virtual world doing it both face to face over zoom and having an electronic platform that you can use okay means that the person at the other end receiving the training has all different types of stimulus to ensure that they are delivering best practice back to your clientele Howard, I mean, I'm going to pick up on a couple of points you've, you've made here, and I think they're absolutely bang on. You know, the truth is that if you look at, I, I, just to give you an analogy, I did some work probably six, seven years ago with a company in, um, in Kent, and not a recruitment business. What they do is they provide these amazing electronic, uh, what I would call them blackboards in my day, big boards uh, that go in schools. And I mean, I'd never seen anything quite like it because the kids have got little iPads, little tablets, and they can watch the screen. It's electronic. They can show films. They can show uh, videos. Uh, kids can write stuff that can appear on. I mean, if your parents, particularly younger children, you'll know about this. For me, it was a complete uh, revelation because when I went to school, which of course, as we all know, was about when the Queen, Queen Victoria was on the throne, um, uh, the only thing we had literally were blackboards and chalk and the level of teaching and ability at that point was uh, very much about pay attention. And if you didn't, you know, they'd throw the, the blackboard rubber at you. Um, that, that happened fairly regularly. Um, so I, I think what I learned very clearly was that modern learning is all about, as you've just said, the visual elements. You know, we know, for example, that YouTube is the biggest TV station in the world. Forget about BBC One or, any, or CNN. It's, it's YouTube, folks. This is what people watch, particularly the younger generation. So people have got accustomed to learning at school and in society from visual, audible, audible as it were, stimulation. And what we know is that if you put people in a classroom environment for, um, an hour, uh, for a day, half a day, they retain very little at the end of that period because their attention span like anybody else, including me, disappears. The best method of teaching people is short, sharp um, sessions. So an hour, I'd say hour and a half to two hours, absolute max. So uh, picking up on your point, Howard, I think those short, sharp sessions using visual, visual stimulation, whether that's external or you do stuff yourself, as I've done in some companies, is very important. I was on the phone earlier to Australia. And I'm going to be, they've asked, there's a company there that have asked me to do some coaching sessions using obviously on Zoom. And we're going to do two hour sessions over a five month period on a particular subject about leadership skills, for example. I think that's the way people learn in this day and age. And I think it's extremely important. I think that's interesting that, you know, we're talking about this. So one of the questions there was what training should leaders be focusing on? Um, and we all need to adapt. And then another one, what's the most single most important channel to training your consultants? So I think the most important thing for training of our consultants at this moment in time as they come back from um, lockdown is we need to go and drill the basics. Every company that I go into uh, and do work with, once okay. I start to really lift the lid, what I generally find from the recruitment side, it is the lack of basics that are preventing them moving forward. It's the amount of corners that are cutting. You can start to sort of look at the amount of consultants that are failing within their business, and it's because they haven't had the basics drilled into them. The yeah. basics aren't part of the recruitment DNA, let's call it. So when we start to look and think about then what channels should you be retraining your consultants on, whether it be old school headhunting, selling retainers, etc. okay, you can't build those type of 
cap or that type of capability with your staff unless they have the ability to deliver the core basics so i think at this moment in time it is the core basics that are really key and as um, you know paul said you know when he, there was you know when he was writing on his slate and they were sort of <laughs> blackboard rubbers at him um <laughs> Recruitment then was very, very much a face-to-face -face game. And certainly when I started in the in the early 90s, it was still a very much a face-to-face -face game where you met your clients, you met your candidates, and you met everybody, and you had a proper discussion with them. And so I think the things rather than what channels should be going into, I think what we should be getting back to is that human interaction, because it's that human interaction that will outweigh AI because people like to buy from people and not so much like to buy from the machine. So we've got to start to think about that before we then starting to jump into that old school headhunting or selling retainers. Let's get the actual basics right. So there's a big blend here for training where you've got old school methodology, but being trained in a new school technique and being delivered in a new school environment, i.e. video, etc. So you've got to start to think about how you sort of you know, move on from there. So again, if you're bringing guys back into the business and they're lacking that drive and they're lacking that, you know, effervescent push to go over the top for you and training's not helping them, then the question is, do, should they be actually in your business? If you've got consultants that are fearing redundancy, even though you've laid out to them, this is the training plan, this is the business plan, this is the sales strategy, these are the target figures that we're going to achieve, then again, they're not the right people. So we've got to start thinking about it in a very different way to what we've done before from a management point of view. So training to me now means focusing on the basics, drilling the basics, irrespective of whether you're a two-man team or a 50-man team, and making sure that what you deliver out to your clientele, your candidates and your clients is of value. And remember, you only have to lift yourself by a very small percentage yeah. to be above the rest of that recruitment marketplace. So, so moving on to the next... Sorry, go on. Just to add to that point, I mean, I think like you, we often talk about advanced training and within the, in the last four months with these weekly webinars, we've talked about the new modern world of work and using video platforms to interact with clients and candidates and the skill sets that we need to adapt to those uh, people buying people, the whole EQ piece. But actually interesting, your point about basics is very relevant. Um, very often when I go into a company and we, we start talking and coaching people and you ask about basics, things for example, like the five common object objections. Now, you know, teaching people to overcome objections in a recessive economy, if you're talking about a basic skill set, is going to be vital. You know, what are the five basics for uh, objections? No need, bad experience, um, using a competitor, using other recruitment methods, cost. Those are, five, those are the five most common objections, the best known in the universe. There are no others, actually. And yet when I ask people, even experienced people, in recruitment businesses, they can't give them to me. Neither often can people really structure open-ended questions. How, what, which, why, where, when stuff. Now, you guys listening will know this is really basic, but I think picking up on how is really strong, good advice here. Let's go back to basics because trying to build advanced sales techniques, if people don't have the foundations, is impossible. So go back to basics in the beginning. Think about the fact we're in a recessive economy. You're going to hear the word no said an awful lot coming up. There are yeses out there. We're going to get a lot of no's. Prepare your people for them and get them to a point where they can deal with the objections, arrange client meetings, which is essential if we're going to move into advanced sales techniques. How do you get people to say they'll meet you, whether that's virtual or face-to-face? -face? Those are the techniques we need to teach people, and it starts, as Howard rightly says, with those basic techniques. It's interesting where the next question is, you know, what training can we get the team to deliver instead of directors and managers doing all the training? Yeah. And I think that's a really great question. And, yeah, I was always one to sort of say that I was very self-aware of the extent of my knowledge, but I was also very aware of the extent of everybody's knowledge within my team. And so when we started to design the academy pool, one of the things that one of the educationalists said is what 
lots of people learn from is being able to regurgitate things back and so we created as part of the academy uh, all the powerpoint presentations not so that people could do the presentations themselves but when they did the presentations it was backing up their knowledge so what we were saying to owners and directors you shouldn't be doing the presentations you should be finding the people that's got the best skill at you know sales calls got the best skill at marketing cvs got the best skills and get them to deliver that training back to them you could also then look at that in a slightly different way looking at the people within your business that may be not great at delivering that part of the sale the sales uh, call and getting them to deliver that part of training because you can give them the material you can get them to sort of bank on that and get them to give that training that means they have got to increase their skill set constantly and it's taking that away from the managers and the directors and what you've then got is more than one or two voices in the business you've got a whole cacophony of voices talking in the business about what best practice is and if you look at any great team they don't just have a captain or a leader they have lots of people on the team who are helping drive the team forward and i think that's the thing that we've got to learn be what well, if lockdown has taught us anything it's thought we can trust people to work from home so therefore we should trust people to be able to deliver best practice across their team but by helping them you need to give them the material to deliver that to your staff and give them a voice let's really drive that and that's again that's part of that getting that malaise out of people what people are good at you're great at this i want you to deliver a course on this you're yeah, great yeah. at this deliver a yeah, course yeah. on this yeah, and get them do get them doing that type of thing yeah and i have it i mean look i think if you're going to get your guys to do some training you better teach them how to train coach the tra you know train the trainer yeah so i mean those are skill sets that are not too difficult to teach people you'll you make a good point there for example how do you know somebody is understood learn what you've taught them it's easy. You ask them to repeat it back. And, and it's like anything. I mean, think back to our learning, talking about school earlier, learning your times table. What do you do? You, you just keep repeating it, repeating it. Two twos are four and so on and so on. And eventually, you know, as another four or five year old, you learn your times table and you never, and you never forget that. So I think it's, it's by rote. You also, you teach your people how to coach people. I think about, again, we're back to basics in some senses. One of the things that I would say that would be great for your people to be doing is desktop training. You know, let's, let's get the guys who do certain things extremely well in your business to coach, mentor people to do the same things that they're doing. Or for those guys to sit in with your less experienced people, face-to-face, -face, <laughs> distancing, permitting, and, and assisting them at the desk rather than formal training. You know, I, I don't know about you, Howard, but I think the things I've learned fastest and the things that stuck with me haven't necessarily been the things that have been taught to me within a coaching environment. It's been it's the stuff that's been taught to me actually at the cold face, you know, listening to an experienced person do something. I mentioned objection handling, listening to them do some objection handling. How did they manage that? Can I use that? Can I adapt that to my style? I've, I mean, my style, if I can use that expression as yours is, is a kind of an amalgam of the things I've learned from so many people over the years, whether that was conscious or subconscious, stuff has seeped in and it's kind of emerged in, in a way that works for me. Um, so, and I've learned from some brilliant people, whether they knew they were teaching me or not, I've been aware of the way they've conducted themselves. So I think that in many ways, a lot of the things that your guys can do to help you is that stuff that is so important at the desk. So how do we do the nitty gritty? Well, you can do the more um, senior stuff. You can do the more strategic uh, leadership stuff for sure. But I think when it comes down to the nitty gritty, you'll probably find your people will learn more from somebody they admire in your office than they might listening to you. There's also a course case that says, you know, bringing an outside voice in, uh, and this is not a sales pitch, guys, honestly, uh, bringing an outside voice in to do some of your training is really important because, again, what it does, it backs up what you are saying to them if you're saying the right things to them. So having that separate voice, having a separate person giving that type of knowledge over to them is really important. So here's the next question, which is a very interesting question, Paul. There's two here together that I'm going to sort of pull together. So how do you persuade the dyed in the wool old school recruiters to change their unproductive habits? And the next question is, how do you convince the old school to adopt modern sourcing recruitment techniques? Oh, God. 
So this is a public platform, isn't it? So I'm not allowed yes. to swear, am I? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a prize out there to anyone that can guess what I'm thinking. Um, uh, look, I mean, it's change or die. <clears throat> and people that have been around for a very long time have to understand that what worked five years ago, 10 years ago, even, even six months ago, is not going to be working as well as it did. In fact, it probably won't work at all. Now, your guys have to understand that. Died in the wall practices. So let's go back to what do we mean by that? Well, okay, let's try and be reasonable and balanced about this. We've just talked about it. So died in the wall practices, if that means they know the basics brilliantly, they can do it like eating, walking, breathing. Brilliant. You know, we don't want that to change because our new environment is going to be all about um, EQ, uh, people buying people great relationships, building trust, building loyalty. If they do that and we designate that, classify that as old school died in the wall, great, let's have more of it, please. But if they're doing things that used to work, but increasingly year after year after year have become less and less effective, we've talked about that. We talked about the superstitious dance a few weeks back where we said, if you do something as the ancient Incas would have done, dance, do the superstitious dance every year on April the 20th for rain um, and only two out of 10 years it rained, but they felt they had to do it every year because if they stopped doing it, it wouldn't rain. They didn't step back from it and think, well, actually it only works two out of 10 times. If that's what's going on in your business with certain people, then you need to in the nicest way, but perhaps very firmly, let them know that it doesn't work anymore and you're not, and they have to change. And I don't think that's a, a negotiable, it's non-negotiable because they will ultimately make less and less revenue for themselves and less and less revenue for the business. And too often I hear people saying, business owners, that person makes me 80,000, 100,000. So they're making me a profit. Whereas my attitude is, what do you think the desk should be making for you? Oh, I think the desk should be making 150,000. So we're not actually making 100K, we're losing 50K. That's my attitude. I actually think that that has to be your attitude, especially during tougher times. So if you've got somebody that refuses to change, refuses to budge, well, you have a challenge on your hands, but I think that it's non-negotiable. If the old practices work, brilliant. Let's do more of it. Come back to the previous question. Get these guys to teach your other people how to do those things as well as they do. Fantastic. But if you know they don't work and increasingly things that we did five years, 10 years, 15 years ago, do not work as effectively anymore. They have to change. And if they don't change, then I'm going to say it out loud, you need to change them. I think that's a very interesting, you need to change them. But I think before we start to think about changing them and think about what their unproductive habits are, we need to change as managers. And what I mean by that is I've had this conversation, well, how often do we review our processes and find out what is unproductive within our process. And this is where data, analyzing data, analyzing our processes come to place. Because if we can go back to our consultants with quantifiable evidence of why they should change and what they need to change, and then put training around what you are training to develop them, then they have no excuse other than to change. And then they go back to Paul, if they're then not willing to change, then you need to change them by force. And the usual force is, thank you very much. We've enjoyed your time working here. You've been very productive for us, but now we're moving on to do this. If you're not prepared to do that, then we are going to let you go. And I know that's a hard conversation to have, especially for big billers, but I've had that conversation with people billing in excess of half a million, a quarter of a million pounds and let them go and then watch the business around them flourish and bloom and absolutely not only just take up the slack that we've just lost but increase the slack so sometimes getting rid of those dyed in the wool recruiters that actually fear change because they rub that off on everybody else so there's sometimes changing that for them is really important so use quantifiable evidence that you can gather from your data from your systems to share why they change put some training process in place and then if they don't change then you have a decision to make on what you want to do with them Howard just a last point around this question you're talking about quantifiable information and I think it's extremely important talk to your clients find out what feedback they're giving you about your people 
And if you find that certain people regularly get negative, negative feedback from clients, you've got to do something about it. If they're burning bridges, you've got a big problem. You've got a problem that needs to be addressed and dealt with. Um, so I would, I would urge you, and I'm going to pick up Howard's point very clearly, particularly people that have been with you for a long time, let's be very clear, you know, you need to do, you need to go through performance reviews and you, your objective, your outcome, the desired outcome is to help them, support them, train them so they can change. But they have to have a willingness to change. And if you find that they're unwilling and to add to the point that the feedback you get from clients is negative, then as Howard says, I'm afraid there are some difficult decisions to be made. Hopefully we don't get to that place. But all of you, all you guys are listening, you will know that you've been in that place before, I'm sure. And there may be people as we're discussing with you right now with you that you're already thinking about. Let's hope that that doesn't happen. But remember that everyone has choices and the choices that people make working for you is to adapt and change, and be valid and be current and be a person that clients and candidates are compelled to work with, want to work with, or they choose not to do that. That's their choice not your choice. If they choose not to do that, then they're people that, as Howard says, need to work somewhere else. So that leads to question to, to another three questions here, Paul, which I think again are, I mean, your comment on 20 questions, we actually have over 40 questions. Uh, <laughs> so uh, here's another three questions that are very, very similar, which flow. I'm trying to make these questions flow on from, it, from, uh, from each other. Okay. How do you let someone go without driving them to the competitor? How long would you retain a pre-COVID profitability biller if they are loss-making post-COVID, presuming reverse allow? And how do you know when it's time to let someone go? <laughs> so uh, we rehearsed, we, we had a chat about this very last question before we went on, didn't we, Howard? We did. And you said that you might embarrass me if I said what I said. <laughs> so I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> But I, how do you know when to let somebody go? This is such a good question. I, I, I think we, we've got to come back to the earlier point. You know, we are, when you're an employer, when you're a boss, when you're a leader, you know, there, it isn't just about providing a job and a salary to somebody. I think it goes far, far deeper than that. Personally, I think that employing people, um, taking people into your business, managing them, leading them, means that you are, in essence, a teacher. I've always said that. I think that when you want to be, if you're going to be a leader, a proper leader, then you take on board the fact that you are becoming a teacher. That means passing on knowledge, wisdom, expertise to people. And I think that provided the people working for you are open, the willing pupils, then I think, if, certainly in my case, I'm more than prepared to spend an inordinate amount of time helping them to develop to become the best version of themselves. If they are, on the other hand, closed and they're not listening, they're not prepared to take on board what you're, what you're trying to give them, not just you, Howard's point, external trainers, coaches, mentors like Howard and I, if they're not listening, they're not prepared to open up and change, then that's the time to let them go. But I think, let's be clear, there's a process to follow. And if you let people go or they decide to leave, let's be clear that at the end of that, you, you feel that your conscience is clear. You've tried to do everything you could within your power to turn that person around and make them valid for your business, valid for the market. Um, and I, I, I must say personally that if I've let people go in the past, I can't think of a single occasion where I've felt any form of self-recrimination. I don't feel, I've felt that I've done everything I can. And actually in many instances, I've tried for far harder and far longer than I should have done. So I think that, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. My answer to Howard was somewhat ruder. I'm afraid I can't say that in a public <laughs> forum. Um, so I'm not going to repeat that. But if you phone me, I might tell you. Um, so I think it's, it's a tough question. Um, but I think that if you get there, you'll know in your heart and you should have recorded to, from a professional perspective, what you've done with that person. How do we stop them going to our competitors this is a really interesting question. I don't often, re I don't often, say this, uh, use Richard Branson as an example. I wouldn't say he's somebody I'd, I'd, I'd place up there. I think he's a hugely experienced and unbelievably successful business person. But I think there's things about him that 
I wouldn't necessarily want to copy. But one of the things he has said is that you train your people so well that they could go off and set up their own business, but you treat them so well that they don't want to. And I think that's a very important thing to say. So it isn't, doesn't come back purely to money. It comes down to how you care for your people. It goes way over and above just you know, giving them a great environment to work in and a great desk to sit at and an opportunity through your business to make money for you, for them. It's much, much more than that. It's more profound than that. So it's about how you genuinely care for people. But of course, there is a point at which people fly the nest. It's, it happens and you should expect it. Um, and I'm sure every one of you over the years has lost people you'd have loved to have kept. And, and you business owners, the guys listening to this today, at some point you went off and opened your own businesses and hopefully you've become extremely successful. That's going to happen to you. Will they attack your business? Well, there's a reasonable chance they might, but you better make sure that you have really good contracts of employment, that you have um, up-to-date restrictive covenants, um, and that you personally are very close to your client base because if you're close to your client base, really close, you, you speak all the time to your customers, then if you lose a very valued member of staff, hopefully you still own that relationship with the client. At least then, and with a restrictive covenant in place, you have a period of time to, to re-cement your relationship and try and ring fence that client so that your ex-valued member of staff has a minimal impact on your business. If they take business from you after a six month period, well, maybe you've only got yourself to blame under those circumstances. So I think expect that at some stage, everybody will lose, leave you because reality is that's mostly the situation, but make sure you stay very close to your client base and do everything in your power to look after your people to the extent that they want to work for you for 10, 20 years. I've worked for two companies for 16 years, 11 years, my own business, 11 years. You know, I, I'm a sticker. If I'm happy, I'm a sticker. And if you make people happy in your business, the chances are they'll stick with you too. I think there's a very interesting three questions. And I think you've covered quite a lot of the topics there that I would, I would sort of uh, echo. But I think the, the one to me that we've talked about an awful lot with regards to management and with regards to what we're doing, that the managers and the owners of the business should be 80% of the time client facing and generally what i find when i look at businesses is that the management isn't client facing and when i speak to you know i i took over a company about four or five years ago for a while and when i spoke to the ceo and said how when was the last time you visited the client and he said i haven't seen a client in five years it starts to wonder why when people left his business and one person left his business and took a two million pound revenue stream and has now created a really lovely business from that you understand why that people can actually walk out of clients uh, walk out of agencies and start a business and not to worry about it so it is about that layer selling you as directors out meeting directors of the business and everyone having a relationship within that business that grows your company profile in the business, not the recruiter's profile in the business. And what a lot of you know, business owners that I, I meet, what their fear is, what happens if my big biller disappears? And it's mainly because they haven't got any control over the client because they have no relationship with that client. So it's about really driving into that relationship uh, and driving into, into that unknown barrier of saying i've got to get out of my ivory tower to a certain degree and out selling to my clients so i safeguard my business for a, a bigger opportunity howard i i just if i could just cut in quickly I, I just a quick analogy and i think you hit the nail right on the head here it's all about relationships uh, i often ask people how did the how did restrictive covenants come about you know why do, why are they prevalent in our industry which industry did they come from People rarely know the answer. Apparently, it was the hairdressing trade. So, you know, I think particularly, and I don't wish to be sexist, but particularly women who find a stylist they love will follow that stylist to various salons and ultimately if they open their own business. I can't speak, obviously, about hair, as you can see. Howard is just lagging slightly behind me on this point. <laughs> um, but um, why do people follow stylists? Because... You know, if you're going to entrust your look to a person, you really want to trust them. You know, you want to make sure that 
you spend a lot of money on your hair that you look great and it's placing your trust in someone and we all know even i remember coming out with a terrible haircut it's not a pleasant experience you feel like you literally feel like your heart's sinking sitting in the chair so restrictive covenants came about in the hairdressing trade to prevent stylists taking their employers customers and we then embrace that in the recruitment industry and it comes right back to howard's point it's all, it's built on trust people pe people buy people so absolutely get extremely close to your clients because sooner or later your 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 people will leave you and at the end it'll be do you know your clients do they trust you do you have a deep relationship with that client if you do then you don't have too much to worry about in my opinion so here's a, a, a view on the, the second part of that or, or the next question part of that was about pre-COVID billers, uh, profitable billers versus loss making. I think you've got to look at what that's what's actually happening there. And if you look at what's happening, if they're loss making after post COVID, is it something that they are in control of or not? Bad re good recruiters don't become bad recruiters overnight. So what you've got to start to think about, is it their marketplace? What is the reason why post COVID that they are making a loss? If it is down to them, if it is they've come back with a malaise and with you haven't, they haven't responded to any of your stimulus, then yes, you might want to think about uh, removing them from the business. But if it's something that hasn't got a problem, and I can give you a prime example of this. Uh, I remember uh, in 2008, uh, I remember having a, rather pointed career ending argument with uh, the HR director or the global HR director for ADECO, who six months ago where I'd been in a training course in Lucerne, he talked about the UK's uh, attrition rate across the ADECO group. And I was said, I've said openly, why don't you come to the UK? I'm happy to work on any system or any course or anything that we can do to help improve our attrition. Why don't we set a steering group up for that? And he was quite dismissive to that idea from there six months later he sat in the office with a spreadsheet and he drew a line across a spreadsheet and said everyone below that line you need to go and sack now and he'd given me this big speech about six months ago about how Italy had this tenure where people have been there 20 30 years etc etc and I ringed two people that were working in my Edinburgh office and I said there's a person that's been there for 20 years and there's a person that's been there for 18 years if you want to go tell her she's sacked you go tell her that she's sacked because her market is the banking market. Her client is Royal Bank of Scotland, et cetera, et cetera. That client has just died and caused the recession. And therefore she isn't a loss making. Her skills are still prevalent in years time. She will be back making us lots of money. You get rid of her now, you're losing a really good valuable member of the business. And he just couldn't see that. So I think you've got to understand what the loss making the problem is before you start to take drastic action from there and work from there. But you also as a manager, and I was very loyal to my people, I stood my ground and actually walked out of the meeting and said, if you want to go sack them, there's the plane ticket, you go and get on the plane to Edinburgh and you go get rid of that person because I think that's immoral compared to what you said to me six months ago, um, which obviously didn't do my career very well at, uh, uh, <laughs> at the board level of, of a deco. Uh, but it is about standing your ground sometimes. And that leads on to a next question, uh, which is a very interesting question. I'm sure Paul and I have got lots of stories about this question. Um, how do you address the issue of directors not singing from the same song sheet or hymn well, sheet? Hymn sheet even. So um, it's a very good question. Um, and maybe this is the single most um, important discussion today, because if the leadership of a business are not aligned, then you cannot have a successful business. You know, I, we've all worked in, in many instances, you guys listening will be, have been in this position, in many of you, where you've been on the boards or you've been senior in previous businesses or you are at the moment in that situation. If you have people who are at the top of the tree, um, um, misaligned, are in dispute with each other, play politics, um, are divisive, create divides in the business, um, sit in a meeting, hear about a decision, disagree, and then instead of falling into line with that decision and throwing their weight behind it, even if they disagree, going off and saying the opposite, you really have a terrorist in your business. And um, it's just unacceptable. You know, we have to be adults. We, 
We sit in meetings, board meetings, senior meetings. We don't win every battle. You know, every argument or every discussion is not one that's necessarily going to go in our favour. Um, but when it, when it goes against you, if there's a vote, if there's a view that is maybe not the same as yours, provided that what we're going to do within the business is not immoral, illegal, um, then you fall into line with it. If you, if you feel strongly as a director that consistently decisions are being made in the boardroom that you don't agree with, that you feel are, are unjust, unreasonable, as Howard's just come up with a point, then you have a choice to make too. If it's a business that is not in line with your thinking, with your morals, with your values, your behaviours, you need to leave. But in the other, on the other side of the coin, if it's an occasional issue that you don't agree with, a decision has been taken, that you don't feel is, is something you would have voted for, you're not happy with it, that's too bad. You know, you have to say, you put a smile on your face, you get out there and you sell it like crazy into the business as if it was the best idea in the world and the one you came up with, because that's the way you do it. And you have to have that unity at the top of the business because your guys can smell um, division from a hundred miles away. And what they'll do is they'll play one against the other. They'll, they'll realize very quickly who they can go to, to get the answers they want rather than accepting the decision of the board. And that could cause terrific harm in a business. So, you know, this is a big issue for any owner of a business, any managing director of a company. It's your job to make sure your people at senior level are all aligned, all on the same page, are all going to convey the same message with the same level of enthusiasm. Your job is to imbue them with that level of passion, get that harmony going on at, at, level, at, at senior level, and make people realize that life is about compromises. I'm afraid that's a fact. You know, we would all like to have our own way all of the time, but I'm afraid that's not the way life ticks. So it's about compromises. You don't want to make too many. I accept that. But sometimes you have to bite your lip and do what's right for the business and fall into line. So if you have somebody consistently at a senior level that does not do that, you need to challenge that person and bring them into line and see if you can bring it around to a reasonable conclusion. If you can't, and you have somebody who's causing you real damage. It's an interesting sort of comment, isn't it? That it's almost the same as, you know, about your, your you know, person that's not performing, when do you let somebody go? And I think a lot of this is sometimes down to the owners of the businesses and the CEOs of businesses when it gets to large businesses. And there's sometimes lack of intellectual humility that they believe their way is the right way or no way. And they're not listening to what other people are saying. So, I think, first of all, you have to listen to what that person's saying. If they're not singing from the same song sheet or hymn sheet, why are they not singing from that song sheet? What's different? But if they're just you know, rejecting your ideas because they, they don't like them and they're not giving you any alternatives, then you've got to start to think that, you know, what, you know, what are they doing? So you've got to start to really think about the whole picture. You have to have, to have that intellectual humility that you know, you're self-aware of what your own knowledge is and someone might be giving you a better way. So you should explore those op op opportunities, explore those avenues. And if you then don't believe that they're right for the business and the other person realizes that you've explored every adventure, you've explored every idea, you've gone there, then you've got to do that. If you go back to the, the Richard Branson sort of scenario, uh, he also said, to help your team, you need to find people who are smarter than you. So do not be the brightest person in the room. So you need to find the way to unlock the potential of that person. So it might be that you're the blocker of that potential and therefore you are not listening to what's happening. It might be that that person is blocking everybody else's potential and they're not listening what's happening. Then you need to make a decision on what you do to make sure the business moves forward. And as Paul said, I've been in lots of board meetings, you know, for big companies where it is an absolute stand-up argument and they debate the points very, very aggressively and absolutely try and push their points home. However, the successful businesses, when they walked out of that room, they walked out of that room as one and sold that to the actual people within the business as if it was their own idea 
never allowed that divide and conquer scenario to happen. So whatever goes on in the boardroom stays in the boardroom. As soon as you walk out of that boardroom, whatever the decision is, everyone needs to be on that decision. If that director is not, and they're doing something different outside the boardroom, which is causing division, then you need to make a decision on what you do with those type of people. Absolutely. So a question here. Um, is again we'll sort of about the board uh, and about the managers uh paul at what point do you as a manager stop coming up with all the ideas to drive the business forward in order to get your staff to do some work if your staff never come up with ideas what initiatives to develop their own desk etc what happens next yeah well that's a, i mean it's a great question the, the, there's a couple of points here I would make. Uh, I think, firstly, you, none of us have to franchise on great ideas. <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, some of the best ideas that work brilliantly in my businesses have come from my colleagues. They weren't coming from me or the board. The difference was that we were open to them. We were listening. And we created situations, meetings, forums, a whole range of different methods to get the ideas from the guys that work for, for us. Excuse me. <clears throat> and I think that, you know, you can sit in your so-called ivory tower of managing a business and you can be blissfully unaware of challenges and issues that some of your guys are facing daily. But if you ask them, what do you think? How do you think we could tackle this? Or what ideas might you have for X, Y, and Z? It's quite incredible. Sometimes, not that incredible actually, sometimes they have absolutely wonderful ideas that are perfect for your business uh, that you can adopt that will make an enormous difference. The, ch the challenge is creating an environment where people feel open and capable of saying what they feel, that they don't feel they're going to be laughed at or put down if they come up with an idea. They don't feel they're going to be made to look a fool. Um, that no matter whether the idea is good, bad or indifferent, it's greeted with enthusiasm it's greeted with positivity by you, the leader, and your leaders. And I think that if you create that open culture where people feel empowered, prepared to speak up, and you take those ideas with relish, with enthusiasm and passion, and you make it happen, and you reward those people, not always financially, but you reward them for their great ideas, you make them feel great about the contribution they've made to your business, then I think you have a forward thinking modern organization. And that's the only way that you can ultimately create a situation where you stop having to come up with the ideas. I had a conversation <clears throat> the other day with a client, a new client who said, we've got to get our people to start making decisions and not stop coming to us. So I asked them how often when they were asked their opinion about situations, did they push back? Did they ask the person asking the question, what do you think? What do you think the answer is? And they laughed and said, hardly ever. To be honest, the, the way we deal with it is we just, because we know the answers most of the time, the most expedient thing we find is just to say, do this, do this, do this. So what they've done is they've created a culture where their staff are refusing to make decisions because it's so much easier to play the game of giving their bosses the chance to answer the, the questions and take responsibility and ownership for those answers. So that if it goes wrong, it's the boss's fault, it's not their fault. So the only way you can break that mold as a manager and as a leader is to start pushing back. What do you think we should do? How do you think we should cope? Give me your, <clears throat> excuse me, give me your thoughts, give me your ideas. When you start pushing back, you'll find people have the answers 99% of the time. They just haven't had the confidence or felt that empowerment to do it. If it's consistently the case, you're always having to come up with the answers. Ask yourself what kind of culture you've, what you've, you've actually come up with here. Have you produced and are you driving towards that open culture that consistently encourages people through a variety of methods to come up with brilliant ideas, great ideas that make a difference? If you have, then, you, you, then with all due respect to whoever's raised this question, you probably wouldn't have raised the question. And if you know that, you're the, you're the person that's consistently coming up with the innovations, then fundamentally you have, in my opinion, to adopt your and change your culture. It's quite an interesting comment. And uh, I'll, I'll give two scenarios that are 
world famous. And I can never remember the name of the first company, whether it was Bryant and May or whether it was Swan Vesta. Swan Vesta, or I think it was Bryant May, if, I, if I'm really right, uh, was actually in the late 1900s, uh, sort of late 1800s, sorry, was on the bank or on the brink of bankruptcy and was unsure the cost of their materials were going up and they were getting a little bit worried about what to do with their business. And they brought all their directors in, they brought you know, business people in to look at ideas on how could they save money. And none of them came up with anything that would save them a great deal of money. They then eventually threw it out to the uh, workforce. And one of the workforce guys came back and said, do you know the most expensive part of our box? And they said, yeah, the sandpaper on the side. He said, yeah. So why are we putting it on both sides? Why don't we just put it on one side and instantly halve their costs by having one simple method that had gone out to the speech to the people, but the people that were fearful of coming forward and speaking to the management because the management had never asked them the questions about what was going on. And the other one was Palmolive, about Palmolive wanted to double their turnover in a year. And they went out to their staff and said they would offer, I think it was offer an extra week's holiday uh, for the best idea. And the best idea, someone said, people are very gullible. They will follow any instruction. So why not put on our bottle, rinse and repeat? And so what they basically did was double the amount of people using their, or double the, the same number of people buying their product, but using double the amount of product because they were now going, oh, I should rinse and repeat. I mean, Paul and I have already talked about the lack of our hair. I never rinse and repeat, but when I had hair, when I was growing up, I'd look at the bottle and it would say, rinse and repeat. So I would rinse and repeat like a lemming. I would just follow that straight away. So think about what you are, culture that you're providing to your people. Do they feel that they can come to you with ideas? Lots of them have ideas. I ran lots of things with lots of businesses about having idea boxes, etc., that people could come and give ideas to and giving awards for the best ideas. And I remember having a, a small team in Leeds and this is what we did for the best idea to drive the business forward every month we put a 50 pound prize up and it was 50 pounds for the best idea the person who won the 50 pounds had a long out lunch a two hour lunch and they had to go out and spend that 50 pounds in their lunch on something that they liked so it couldn't be you know paying their bills off or anything like that it was something for that was personal for them and they had to bring that back into the office and the team would then vote on whether they thought that was a worthwhile prize or not. And if not, they had to go out and buy another one and take it back and buy another one. So it was an idea, but what it did, it created lots and lots of ideas because lots of people wanted to win that 50 pounds and it was quite a fun way of doing things. So you've got to ask your team, you know, remember, if you're the most smartest person in the room or you think you're the most smartest person in the room and you're not listening to other people, then you're in the wrong room. You need to be in a room surrounded by people who are smarter than you giving you better ideas. We've got three minutes, Paul, so I'm going to ask one question. I think, hopefully, it will take us three minutes. Let me try and find uh, one that I think will take us less than three minutes. Okay. <laughs> Should we use personality profiling to assess potential consultants? Yes, is the easy answer. I think it's a great tool. Um, let's be clear. I think if you're using um, psychometric testing, uh, I think it forms one part of the interview process. In other words, you don't rely on it solely. What I've found when I've used psychometric testing as part of that interview process is that it kind of, re it tends to reinforce what I've already deduced from my in initial interview. Um, but I think it's, it's very helpful. Uh, I, I've used in the past um, and often still do psychometric testing that, tends to evaluate emotional intelligence, which I think is, as I'm sure you guys will agree, absolutely essential in our industry sector. I'm really keen to understand their level of emotional intelligence, EQ. And I think that um, it tends to, when I get the answers through and it's multi-questions, you do it online, I, I'll read through the report and think, yep, that's exactly what I thought, that's what I thought, that's what I thought. And very often it provides competency-based questions for me to dig a bit deeper. So don't do it and use it purely as the method to say yes or no to a candidate who wants to join you. Use it as an add-on to your own professional skills as qualified interviewers. I think my only answer to that question is very simple, is that 99% of every recruitment company will hire on skills 
and yet fire on behaviors. And so we need to start to think about what we are profiling when we bring people in. If we're purely profiling on skill, then we'll get lots of skillful people that might not hit your culture, might not be right for your culture and maybe block certain things and cause issues in your culture. If you get the right behavioral person with the right personal profile, you can train them on the sales skills. You can develop them. And I always say I would rather have five people billing 150K a year each that are the right profile than one person billing half a million that's destroying lots of other people because their behavioral profile is appalling. And you have to think about it in that way. So if you get the sound, surround yourself with the right people, well, that also means that you can start to look at the strengths and weaknesses of your people. So when you're talking about people who want to come out with ideas, if you've got a team of people who are generally analytical and analyze everything, they'll criticize everything that you do. If you've got a team of people who've got analytical, people who've got good at thinking ideas, people good at doing, people good at implementing, etc., and you've got all rounded skills, then what you'll find is that you get a rounded team and you get better information from your team, better input from your team and better output from your team. Paul, that is the hour. Ladies yes. and gents, I'd like to thank you for the hour. It's been a really interesting sort of hour from Paul and I's point of view. We have literally gone through half the questions that we've got. So we've still got an awful lot of questions to ask. And I'm sure you guys now have also suddenly realized there are a lot more questions that you can be asking. So again, I think what we're going to do next week is we're going to throw out the same uh, challenge Let's send some questions to Paul and I. Paul and I have read these questions and we thought, wow, this is going to be a really interesting hour. We're going to have to really work hard to come out with uh, good answers. I hope we've uh, uh, yeah, fulfilled our capabilities uh, for you. But next week, we want more questions. We want to do the same. Next week, I think we've got a guest, have we not, Paul, yes. uh, that we're going to bring in as well, which again will give us a different vision and a different view on, on various different things. But you know, if you've got any questions that you want to come to us on a private point of view, feel free to contact Paul and I privately and we will by all means answer any of those questions because I know some of them are quite personal to you guys. So here's our, our contact details. Um, but again, that just leaves us to say thank you very much, guys. It's been a great webinar. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have any sessions, feel free to, uh, any questions, feel free to send them to Paul and I and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Have a wonderful week ahead. And thank you again for joining us.